Well, let me thank everyone for joining us today. I'm John Yates, and I chair the technology practice at Morris, Manning and Martin, and I'm proud to be one of the co-sponsors of the Technology Executives Roundtable Charlotte. We've got a great program today and an excellent turnout, so thanks for joining us for the lunchtime hour. And our program is going to be on leading VCs from the Carolinas and the coasts and an opportunity to hear from several of the leading venture capitalists and tech investors from throughout the country. We're particularly pleased to have folks from the West Coast and folks from this area and people that are making investments here in the Queen City. I want to also note that our next meeting is May 18th, and it'll be a morning meeting from 7.30 to 8 when we'll have breakout rooms, and then from 8 to 9, we'll have the main meeting. And the exciting thing about the May 18th meeting is it will be a joint meeting of the other TER chapters. So it'll include TER Charlotte, Atlanta, South Carolina, and the newest chapter, Florida, where we just had a meeting earlier this week with excellent attendance. And the benefit of this meeting is that we're gonna talk about the survey results from a survey that you will be receiving relating to technology executive compensation. And this survey is one of the most comprehensive surveys that will give you data that can be extremely valuable as you determine compensation for your executives. And it's one of the few surveys that also is used by compensation committees and boards because it's relevant to tech companies in the Southeast. Whether you're in Charlotte, Atlanta, South Carolina, or Florida, this is the information that's gonna be a lot more valuable to you than data that might come from other sections of the country. So it's important when you get the email in a few days, please complete the survey. It doesn't take a long time. It's anonymous from the standpoint of information. There's no identifiable information provided, but it'll be great data for your company. So look for the email and complete the survey. So shifting to the next slide, the mission of our organization is one to provide this forum, virtual as it is right now, for member CEOs, CFOs, and executives of fast growing tech companies in the Charlotte area to share, challenge, and test your ideas freely so you're better equipped to run your companies. So it's really an open opportunity for you to have dialogue, to get to know one another, and build a unique community in Charlotte for tech executives in all sections of the city and the county. So let me now turn it over to my good friend and uh, co-founder of the Technology Executives Roundtable, John Christenberry, and John will go through a list of sponsors and move us from there. Thanks, John. Uh, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, you know, this couldn't be possible without our sponsors. I just want to take a moment to recognize them my firm, CBRE, Commercial Real Estate, Morris Manning Martin, Signature Bank, Insperity, Will & Webb, MBL Advisors, Dixon Hughes Goodman, Dual Blue Partners. Moving on to Zoom etiquette, um, I, I think everybody has um, much, a ton of experience at this point with Zoom. So just please mute during the presentation. There will be questions towards the end. If you want to have a question, uh, Feel free to enter it in the chat and we'll address it then. Uh, set your view to speaker view. And just note that we're recording this for educational purposes. Uh, this is no, not a legal accounting or tax advice. Consult the advisor, whether it's sponsors or any um, of your current uh, advisors. Uh, so we've got a great cast today and I wanna introduce our moderator, Nick Forrest. Nick's a partner in the corporate tech group at MMM and represents most of the leading tech companies here in Charlotte and the Southeast. He's handled dozens of venture capital transactions with funds from Carolinas and the coast. So Nick, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much for that intro, John. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, appreciate the audience for taking the time to join us today. Uh, honored to, to moderate a, a very talented panel. Uh, we've got a diverse set of panelists from well-respected funds across the country. So I'm sure you know, the audience will, will really appreciate hearing uh, some diverse perspectives here. So folks are in for a good one. Um, special thank you to those panelists for pouring into the Charlotte ecosystem here and, and into this great TR organization. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and, and introduce each one of them. And then we'll kick it off into a discussion on venture investing in 2021. Um, of course, feel free, as, as John Yates mentioned, to drop some questions into the chat along the way. I'll try to, I'll, I'll try to do my best to moderate that in, in addition to moderating the discussion and, and we'll get your questions answered. So um, 
with that, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and, and jump into to intros. Next slide. All right, first off, we got uh, Frederick Gross, a, part, a newly minted partner at Storm Ventures. Congrats on that, and co-founder of Black VC. He's out of uh, Menlo Park, California. Frederick, why don't you tell us a little bit about your fund, uh, stage of investments, check size, uh, maybe particular verticals of interest. Yeah, well, first of all, Nick, uh, thanks for having me and for inviting me to the to, to this, this space here. Um, we've been big fans and, and enjoyed the partnership with MMM over the years uh, here at Storm. So, you know, how to think about us, you know, we're, we're a pretty traditional venture firm from the perspective of, you know, we've been around for just over 20 years. Um, we're early stage focused. So what that means is about 80% of what we do is, you know, what we would call traditional series days um, with companies that have found some level of product market fit. Um, and then we deploy anywhere between, call it, you know, as low as a couple hundred thousand, but on average closer to three to four million uh, in a lead or co-lead position. Um, and our one big sort of unique, uh, I guess, element is that all we do is B2B. So we aren't focused on anything that isn't uh, in the B2B realm. Um, and generally you're looking at mostly software as a service, business models, um, and, you know, our way of supporting founders is all around go to market. So we spend a lot of time working with companies on navigating, building out sales, marketing, and customer success uh, systems and processes that can work and scale with, you know, hopefully positive unit economics at some point in time. Um, so that tends to be the way we look at things. And I lead uh, our practice investing outside of the Bay Area, uh, which is part of the reason I've gotten to, to partner with you all here. I'm excited to, to continue to build the relationship. Good stuff. Thanks, Frederick. All right, next up, we have Don Rainey. Uh, Don is a general partner at GrowTech Ventures, uh, headquartered in Arlington, Virginia, although Don heads up the Charlotte presence. Uh, Don, take it away. Sure. GrowTech's a 37-year-old firm. We're investing our ninth fund. Um, the fund is about $150 million. We do Series A, typically one to three million, moved around. We do a lot of uh, uh, cybersecurity, uh, SaaS, B2B or B2B2C. I've been a venture capitalist for 20 years and my particular nexus is on things that have a large audience, which sometimes may be uh, SMBs or consumers or a class of professionals. More recently, we, you know, we're doing a lot of FinTech, PropTech, two-sided marketplaces and cybersecurity. I mean, thanks. Good stuff, thanks, Don. All right, uh, next we have the infamous Sam Tieden. Uh, Sam's an investor at Anthos Capital. Um, they, they, they're headquartered in Santa Monica, California, although Sam heads up the, the East Coast Charlotte presence. Sam, tell us a little bit about Anthos. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And infamous is uh, is not the word I would choose, and definitely wouldn't choose to follow Don either. But but here we go. Um, yeah, Anthos, we're a seven hundred and sixty million dollar minority growth equity fund based out of Santa Monica. Um, really, where where we've focused over the last fourteen years is on you know a variety of buckets. Think consumer internet, consumer product, and B two B software. Um, really, what drives our our focus is looking to back kind of exponential growth businesses that are really attacking a problem where they can be winner take most uh, type result and in, in where they're playing. So we will focus at a variety of stages. Check sizes for us really range. Uh, they can range from a $5 million Series A check or scale all the way up to a $100 million check. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about us. Perfect. All right, last but not least, we have Monique Villa. She's an investor at Mucker Capital, uh, also headquartered in Santa Monica, California. Uh, she leads up the, the uh, sorry, the Nashville presence. Monique, tell us a little bit about Mucker and yourself. Thanks, Nick, and, and thanks to everyone for having me. So my name is Monique Villa. I'm an investor with Mucker Capital, which is an early stage fund. As Nick mentioned, we're headquartered out of Santa Monica, but now we have offices in Nashville, as of two years ago in Austin as of last summer. We're currently investing out of our fifth fund, which is a $250 million vehicle, writing anywhere from a 100K pre-seed check all the way up through a $5 million Series A check to start. In terms of areas of focus, we started out over a decade ago talking about how software is eating the world and uh, really looking at things that are software enabled or tech enabled, but that's taken us to both 
consumer and enterprise facing companies. And we have a really scattered uh, and unique portfolio as such. I think the one thing that our, all of our founders have in common is that they have a very, um, they have a unique insight to, to begin with, but they're also very capital efficient in the early days to really prove out the market and do the hard work in that first year or two. And they're all setting out to build really big businesses. And so we help them along that path and uh, really advocate for not over raising money prematurely. So that's that's usually our big, big headline when we're getting to know founders. Uh, we invest all over the US and Canada. We've had the great uh, honor to co-invest with Anthos. So great to see Sam here. And yeah, we're just really excited about everything we're seeing kind of post COVID in terms of entrepreneurs coming out of the woodwork to answer the call for new services and products that are needed in the market. So we see a lot of opportunity at, at the early stage. Excellent. Thanks, Monique. Um, all right, with that, I think we can just jump straight into a few questions. And again, feel free to uh, drop some questions into the chat audience. Um, so now that we know a little bit about your funds, how about um, give us some insight on how you're sourcing deals? How are you finding companies? And, and then beyond maybe just the, 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 the source of deal flow, um, and Monique, you can field this one and then we'll, we'll kick it over to Frederick Burt or next. But um, are you guys focused in a particular geography and, you know, now with no, no events, right? And, and not seeing folks pitch, it, how are you, yeah, how are you sourcing in, the, in a post-COVID world? Yeah, so very similar to pre-COVID, just the, the happy accidents look a little different when you're, when you're stuck at home. Um, I would say sourcing is really a 24-7, 365 effort and... I never feel that I take my, my hat off. <laughs> um, it could be I'm on Twitter, which I think is a great opportunity for people in different geographies to connect with one another. Like we see in the Southeast, forums like Twitter really bring the Southeast together in many ways. Clubhouse has been one of those. Um, but honestly, we're seeing a ton of inbound because there's just a lot of need in the market. And so trying to field inbound while also being thoughtful about outbound. It could be, I'm talking to someone who seemingly does not work in tech or innovation uh, in their day to day, but they have a cousin whose friends, I don't know, sister is launching a new thing and they knew you worked in tech. So can I connect you? Like it's very random. Um, so I think sitting down and thinking about how do I source a deal uh, reminds me of an entrepreneur sitting down and saying, what is there, what market opportunity exists for me? Um, there's opportunities everywhere. It's just a matter of, of keeping your eyes open and, and, and looking for them. Right, that's great. And, and Frederick, I know you mentioned you, you're sort of focused outside of the Bay Area. Um, how are you sourcing deals? Yeah, you know, so I, I'd agree actually with, with Moon Monique that it's, it's some ways it's, it's a continuation of practices that we've been building, but just a reliance less on the, the events and the spontaneity that just physical interactions can kind of drive. And so for us at Storm, for me personally, what that means is it's been doubling down with our earlier stage sort of down uh, pipe, down funnel, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, participants and, you know, earlier stage funds that we have historically partnered with. Um, and a lot of service providers. So, you know, that means reaching out to local partners, you know, at the pre-seed level uh, in our target ecosystems, uh, trying to partner with them to do smaller events for their portfolio or stakeholders in those ecosystems to talk about, you know, hey, how do you navigate fundraising in the COVID environment? Um, and then, you know, it's been leaning into, you know, folks like you guys, MMM, uh, and utilizing your bandwidth and spread and, and access to these ecosystems to better understand how we can cater and, and work with your clients as well. So, you know, there's been a lot more focus, I'd say, on, on leveraging those relationships and, and investing in them. That, that makes sense. Uh, Monique, you mentioned Clubhouse. Have you actually found a deal on Clubhouse? No, I'm not. I'm not looking to source deals on Clubhouse. I know some people are, and I think I like media and new mediums too much to think about, oh, I can turn this into a sourcing machine. I just, I am reluctant to do that. I have too much fun. Um, so 
you know, generally speaking, I've only been on it for maybe a week or so. I tried to resist for quite a while, but um, funny enough, I, I hosted something last night and someone I do know in Nashville, I guess, joined and said, hey, that reminded me I should send you this deal. <laughs> so I might, I might have one to report back on, but it was right. completely unintentional. <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right, this one, uh, this one's for Sam and Don. Um, when you're, when, so we've moved beyond sort of sourcing the deal. You have um, some metrics, you know, financial projections um, that that a potential company you guys are kind of sifting through. So, what are the key metrics you're looking at when you're deciding whether or not to invest in a company from a you know, sort of a KPI standpoint? What, what are you What are you looking for? And then, how are you sort of stress testing any of the numbers that that folks are giving you? And maybe Don, you can you can you can start. We'll we'll dovetail back to Sam. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the first thing I like to talk about is how the maturity of their of their core competencies or the critical things that they need to do. So the maturity is really how effective are they doing these things and how efficient? Because a lot of times in the early stages, you don't know if you have a four-step sales process or a nine-step sales process. And to the degree that you need to know CAC or you need to figure out some other key metrics, I like to start with the maturity. Uh, are they effective? And uh, efficiency is a, is a good use of money. I think that being said, to answer the question more directly, CAC is always the, the critical one. How much is it going to acquire cost to acquire these customers? Because uh, if you have some presumptions or assumptions about what you can sell it for and how long there'll be customers, um, if the, the, the CAC is the starting point. So that's always where I look. Makes sense. Sam, how about you? Yeah, I mean, definitely agree with that. With with the Anthos lens on, you know, we look at both consumer and enterprise, and and they're drastically different when evaluating a business and, and the metrics that you value there. Um, you know, I think CAC definitely plays in both, but you know, wh where we look at it is like retention. Um, you know, really making sure that you know what's being sold is really being like highly utilized, and you can take that to the consumer side and say like, how often are they accessing it, and like is this becoming something that they are heavily dependent on or spending just a lot of time in? Um, so, you know, how we kind of take that a step for, further and really validate like what we're given and, and, um, and kind of stress test it against the market. You know, we spend a lot of our time ahead of, comp of, ahead of these conversations with companies and, and even like in the investment cycle of, you know, understanding like what the market dynamics are and talking to, um, big corporates that understand like, hey, where's true value driven in this? And through those conversations, we can usually drive to the point of understanding, hey, true value is actually being felt here, which then can be reflected on like really nice retention or, um, you know, a, a really quick sales process. Okay, good, good. So maybe the, the softer side of, of that, um, and maybe we'll start with Frederick on this one. Um, when evaluating a, a, a potential investment target, how about let's let's talk about the the founding team, right? Um, what are you what are you generally looking for? What what's most important to you? Is it the track record of, as an entrepreneur? Is it industry experience? Is it the diversity among the, the team members? Um, what what sort of makes the dream team from an entrepreneur's perspective? Yeah, yeah. So. For, for me and, and for, for us, the firm, you know, I think the first thing we're always trying to really unpack is, you know, why, what is their deep sense of understanding of the fundamental pain or the problem that they're going after to, to solve, right? Is it because they experienced it in a previous life, right? When they were in an opera, you know, when they were working for another company, um, or is it something that they just spent a lot of time researching uh, with, you know, potential you know, diligence calls with, you know, would be potential customers that they're going to be building for in the future. So really understanding, you know, like how deep of an understanding do you have to that problem? Um, and then really understanding as they think about that solution that they're coming up with, you know, what does that initial product market fit look like? What does that initial market size look like? And have they thought about how to expand and build and build an even bigger company beyond this initial sort of first act? And so we really spend a lot of time with the founders really understanding their thinking. 
Um, we also try to unpack in our diligence, and this has become more important since COVID because we can't spend time with founders. What's motivating them, you know, intrinsically and extrinsically? Like, why are they doing this, right? Building companies is hard. Um, and it's, you know, doing it during COVID is, is even harder than I think it's ever been. And so really for us understanding what's motivating the, the founding team um, helps us just get the conviction ultimately to oftentimes, you know, decide if we want to write the check, assuming that, you know, we hear it and it resonates with us, right, fundamentally. Um, and then I think the last thing that we often will try to ask ourselves uh, as a team is, you know, what's the chances that this team breaks up? Right. And, and what we're trying to unpack here is have they spent time working together as founders, as an early management team? Um, and have they gone through conflict as a team together as well? Um, and if so, how are they managing it? Uh, how do they think about it? Have they matured to the point where they ha can discuss like the strategies they are using? And look, obviously our founding teams uh, range in terms of the maturity across all these different levels, but those are the kinds of things we're trying to look for and unpack while we're meeting, interacting and diligencing, um, you know, the founders that we'll hopefully get to work with. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and you mentioned, you know, not being able to, to see the team um, in person. Um, I imagine by now, probably all the investors on, on this, this panel have, have made investments in, in companies they hadn't ever met in person. Um, any particular, you know, challenges or different approaches, you know, just conducting this via Zoom? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd say we rely more heavily on doing more references uh, and more blind references than we did you know, pre-COVID, where we you know, just got to spend time with people. Uh, I could sort of you know, trust our own two eyes, two ears, uh, you know, and, and senses to some extent as we interacted and built a relationship. So the blind reference has become a much more important. Um, and I think you know, we think a lot more you know, when we invest in other ecosystems around, hey, is there a partner on the cap table? That is newer at the end of the day that can get there if there needs to be you know a reason to have uh, some support or a conversation that needs to be done in person um, but that's something we, we were thinking about pre-covid as well i mean that was part of our fundamental strategy uh when it came to investing outside of the bay was to work with partners in these ecosystems and so you know i think just that reliance on the the references and doing more blind ones has been the biggest shift makes sense sam how about you and and um and actually in addition to, to what we're talking about um, uh, another sort of wrinkle to throw at you um, when evaluating uh, the founding team. Is there any, uh, do you ever sort of avoid uh, a company that has a founding team that have relatives, right? It, it's just a couple of brothers, you know, uh, have you ever invested in a company like that? Um, in addition to answering the rest of the question, but curious your take on that too. Yeah, I, I mean, we are definitely not scared of investing behind brothers. We have an investment called Super Coffee, which is like a direct to consumer ready to drink uh, coffee brand that's formed by three brothers where, I mean, they are awesome. I mean, their their mentality and how they approach the world is pretty interesting. I mean, their motto inside their um, office is like, you know, work hard and don't be an asshole. And like, I just think that is just very indicative of like their um, like, personality they, they want to work really hard and execute together as a family and, and, and that that means a lot but kind of going back to what else or, or what other things we assess um in an entrepreneur it for us it, in me in particular i think it's a lot more about like fundamentally really understanding your business and being able to articulate that quickly to me re reflects like wow you know exactly the market opportunity you know what you're going after i think that typically will also be um shown in like maybe some past industry experience, but that's definitely not something we, we heavily rely on. Um, just like rhetoric, we are doing a lot more of these references um, ahead of time and um, really making sure that, you know, our initial reaction to what we see and, and feel in an entrepreneur is, is true. And uh, what, you know, people, you know, good and bad feedback, um, you know, it can kind of lead us there. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it's so much of like the, specific um track record but I, I do think it is just like hey do you fundamentally understand what is going to drive your business and the future growth opportunities that can come from like the core platform you're building today perfect okay um all right how about you know we're, we're sort of moving on now to uh, to actually making the investment right um and and i'll 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 Throw this one over to uh, Monique first. When when entrepreneurs are in the early stages of preparing for a raise or, or reaching out to a, a VC, 
Um, what are you, what are some key do's and don'ts? Um, and, and feel free to share uh, maybe some 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 horror stories or some success stories that, that you've encountered. What are sort of best practices that, that folks should be thinking about as they as they embark on the fundraising journey? Yeah, you know, it's it's hard because there is so much advice online, I think, for founders that's conflicting. And so when you think about fundraising, the way that Mucker, for example, advises our companies might look entirely different from how another fund might advise their companies. And or if you're a founder and you don't have the benefit of, of having someone in your corner when you set out to raise. And so it's really hard to decipher what you should and shouldn't do. <laughs> um, so I'll share kind of our philosophy for fundraising. It might sound a bit different from, again, some of the prevailing wisdom, but we are, we like to really challenge our companies to question the why. So are we raising out of, hey, we're going to run out of money in a month? Hey, are we raising because this will help speed up our product timeline or the way that we can deliver something that could end up being really meaningful for the business? Um, is this to accelerate our growth or are we having to fabricate growth by buying it? Um, I think that these are all things that require some really honest uh, self-assessments from the founders and CEO and, and looking at the company. And when it comes to thinking you know the answer to those questions, if you set out to fundraise, then you think, okay, well, what is our strategy? And a lot of the, again, a lot of the recommendation that's out in the market is go fundraise 24 seven, be in front of people 24 um, seven, talk to all the investors, build all the relationships early, that sort of thing. And that might work for some people. Uh, from Mucker's perspective, we really encourage founders to hide out and focus on the business until they're really ready to talk to investors and they have the right metrics in hand. And, and they can also then control their narrative a bit. And I can use some very specific examples. So we definitely have some founders in the portfolio that love fundraising. <laughs> and we, we try to say, hey, maybe push that off for another six months. Uh, you have a lot to do here with the business, but they just love talking to investors. They love taking those intros. And I mean, I've, I've been in this long enough. I started in VC back in 2013 and I have seen companies now take that approach or that posturing and squash their valuations that they're able to get, um, the types of partners that they attract. And it really significantly impacts their trajectory. And right before I logged into this call, I'm helping one of our Mucker Labs, so one of our accelerator companies fundraise, and we're just starting outreach this morning. So it's like, this is happening. And what's going for them really well already is I caught up with them last week and I said, hey, who are the VCs that you've talked to today? I just wanna get a sense of the landscape. Like, who have you been in touch with? And they're like, we've never talked to any investors. We've only, we've only worked with Mucker Lab. So this will be our first time talking to VCs. And so all of the intros that I'm making are, hey, no one has seen this deal yet. Are you interested? And everyone's writing me back in two seconds saying, yes, can I talk to them today? Like freaking out because how exciting that they're the first investor to see this deal. Um, and so trying to think through how can a founder control their narrative a bit by not letting it out of the bag a little too soon, um, but also being really strategic and saying, we need to focus on some things with, with the business first. And then if we decide we want to raise, then what is our strategy? And how can we keep hold of that strategy um, and our narrative intact so that we can really be selective with who we work with? That's great, that's great. Thanks for, thanks for that. Uh, Sam, uh, how, about, how about you? Uh, what are some you know, key you know, do's and don'ts as, uh, as you see it from your perspective as, as founders approach the fundraising trail? Yeah, I mean, I'll kind of talk from like the the sourcing side here a little bit of just like what I really enjoy seeing and and you know I, I think what gets us ex excited internally to be that investor. Um, a lot of that is is um, you know I we really like to hear when entrepreneurs come in and and know where they need help, where their blind spots are. Um, so therefore, we can 
you know, accurately be able to come to the table and say, hey, we have XYZ solution or we have, you know, people internally, advisors, et cetera, you know, that have spent time in and around that space and can kind of help you think through it. Um, you know, no, no business is perfect. And we know that and we don't expect that. Um, so I really enjoy to kind of have that open, honest conversation about people um, and entrepreneurs understanding like where they're really good, where they're bad, where they need help. And it's not, you know, a, a negative in, in anybody's eyes, you know, when, when you do come and kind of, you know, look for that. Um, I, I also think, um, you know, to kind of piggyback on Monique's point a little bit, just like understanding what, what the intention of going out there, you know, is for, um, and then relying on people like Mucker and others, if they're already on your cap table to go ahead and like comb through a list of investors that they spend time with who they believe would be a good fit and kind of fill that purpose. Instead of going out and talking to a hundred investors that is going to go and just cloud your judgment of like, am I making the right decision or wrong decision? You know, go ahead and start with a smaller subset that can fill the need of what you're looking for and build those authentic relationships um, rather than going after highest, like price has to be competitive in this environment. It is very much of a commodity. Um, so being able to find a, a partner that can really, you know, one, you, you want to spend time with, um, two, that that you see they align in, in the vision that you have with the business. Um, and that, you know, that includes the future capital raises that are going to come following the, the one you're kind of, you know, uh, engaging in. One thing, if I can jump in to add to Sam, so we, when we're sending deals, so we're pre-seed in some of these companies, so we could be the very first check, like in this, this company's example, we pay attention to the feedback all of our companies have gotten from the market when we have other companies going out to raise. And so we know pretty much up to the minute what people are saying in the market. And for us, we want to send deals to, com to firms who build early conviction on their own. And so not investors who say to our founders, because then we hear about it, oh, well, I want to see what these other people say about your deal, or I want to send them to, you know, they send them around and want to get sort of group think from other firms. And that lack of conviction is something that we remember. And we say, okay, well, we're probably not going to send you this deal again, because you're just going to pass pass the uh, basket around <laughs> and so we would rather work with firms that can make their own decisions and will really be supportive of those companies long term and not care so much about what other VCs are saying about the deal. That's good. That's good insight. All right. A uh, question here for, for Don um, and then Monique will circle back to you on this one too. Um, so what are some of the biggest issues, Don, that, that you've seen uh, from a business or, or legal standpoint that you've experienced doing deals? Um, and then, and then, you know, what did you do to address them? So, um, you know, from my perspective, I see, you know, a fair amount of legal due diligence problems come up uh, fairly frequently. And, you know, there's a lot that can be done on the front end to avoid that. But curious to hear, um, Don, yours, and then Monique, your, uh, your perspective on, on that one. Yeah, you definitely need uh, good legal due diligence done. Um, you know where the, the things tend to come out is one in business contracts that might have funky terms uh, that allow the customer to depart uh, quickly or abruptly and or have some IP rights or some other things or, you know, just have a fuzziness. And if you're predicating some aspect of valuation on them, that fuzziness is a problem and you need to understand it. The other one commonly is you start out with three founders and they have three equal parts and two founders are killing themselves and one is living a, a life of semi-retirement and um, or otherwise not as engaged. And the group, the three of them have never resolved the fundamental equity, if you will, of, of that arrangement. And that is something you want to fix because um, left untouched it becomes um, a larger problem. And then finally, you know, we do background checks on folks and uh, having done it for 20 years, I think I've seen every crime on one of them other than murder. I haven't seen a murder yet, but I've seen everything else in people's backgrounds. And um, it's best 
uh, and those are problems, uh, that some of which are serious enough you can't talk them through. But um, it's best to telegraph issues uh, in the past uh, from a founder or founders that will pop up on one of those. Monique? Monique, what, how about you? Yeah, so there's all sorts of things that will come out through the legal process. So um, yes, founder dynamics is a big one. And even a co-founder who's not really active at all with the business, that's a real red flag for us because to us, that's not really a co-founder. So some of that will come out. Um, I think a bunch of non-standard terms, maybe that they've been issued from other investors, we come across quite a bit. And I think something that gets lost uh, with, with some of these terms is that you as the investor entering into a deal with the company at that point in time has nothing to do with deals that the company has agreed to with other investors prior to that deal, right? So you have an agreement uh, mutually agreed upon between you and the company. And, it, and sometimes there's just these kind of wacky terms that people have painstakingly put together to make sure that, you know, they're somehow, uh, you know, not going to be snubbed by a future deal that's done. It's like, look, like that was your agreement in, term, in terms of valuation or whatnot. Um, you know, we see those pop up and they will slow down the process. And actually I've seen some companies not be able to raise because of some funky terms that they've agreed to with past investors that kind of overreached into the future a bit. Um, and so then they just couldn't raise. And that was terrible, right? Like they didn't realize that they were handcuffed by their first investors. So there's all sorts of things that surface during the legal process. Um, but I also think I've seen founders kind of fabricate urgency during the legal process to try and get things to move along, but it also doesn't really help anybody either because it just takes time and it requires being able to go through every detail and make sure that we're aligned and make sure there's nothing hidden in there. And we'll have founders who are saying, hey, here are the legal docs on a Friday. We want to get this all buttoned up by Tuesday if you can send us your notes. It's like, we can't, we literally can't do that. Um, I, I've dealt with that the last two weeks and I have spent my entire Friday and Saturday wading through 50 page documents. It doesn't really help anybody. Um, so I think just understanding it takes time and, and you have to go through some general due process. That's good. Uh, it sounds like a takeaway is um, make sure your founding team is, is solid and everybody's contributing before you, you start the fundraising process and um, don't agree to, to wacky terms uh, early on. So, Nick, uh, jump one, in. It. Oh, go ahead, Frederick, jump in. Yeah, I was going to add one thing, you know, which is that, like, I think a lot of times founders don't realize that, you know, whatever you've done to, you know, in the history of the business sets up the expectations moving forward. So, you kind of create precedence. And it's really important to think about that, right? Like, while you certainly have distinct relationships with different investors know that the next set or the next round investors will look through those terms and understand the relationship. And if you gave something or something changed and it was material, like it's likely going to be asked for again, and you've set that precedent. So it's something to think about as you're going through that process, you're negotiating with, with your investors, um, you know, at, at every stage, because it, it, I think people don't realize that sometimes. Um, and certainly at Series A, we're often, you know, the, the second uh, or, or the, you know, the real or bigger institutional fund coming in. Um, at the cap table, and we will certainly look and want to understand, and we're either going to try to clean it up, or, you know, we will probably still take pieces that were asked for before, and that's going to get asked for at Series B, C, and, and onwards. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, and I, I've seen that on a number of different terms, but, you know, financially speaking, you know, that's sort of the, um, you know, maybe uh, giving a participating preferred treatment and, and a seed round for a million dollars, who cares, right? It's a million bucks. Well, play that forward into an A, B, and C, and suddenly, you know, fifty million dollars is coming off the table before you know there's any sort of participation, and that's a tough spot for a founder. So, completely agree. It's it's um, your your early terms have lasting impact. Speaking of early terms, um, how about in in Frederick? You can feel this one uh, as well. Um, how about valuations, right? And 
I know early on people were a little skittish, you know, in, in, in the COVID environment, but honestly, from my perspective, I, I don't think valuations have done anything but go up in the technology sector. It seemed like there was a pause in investment for a period of time. And then after that, we were, just, you know, at least back where we started. So um, how are you seeing valuations in the, in the current environment? And then um, on top of that, we actually have a question from Scott Tony in the chat. Um, how do you think about, um, how do you think about valuing pre-revenue companies? And, and, you know, that's sort of finger in the wind a little bit. So um, yeah, I, I'll let, let you answer that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'd say, look, valuations, we've certainly seen continue to go up. Um, you know, I, I'd say, you know, there, there's just so much capital uh, in the market to some extent going after, you know, great deals, um, you know, that's giving founders a lot of ability to, to, to drive some leverage, right. And get, other great partners. It's why you hear, you know, investors talk about capital itself being a commodity to some extent, right? It's about how we can support, how we can help. That's oftentimes what we're talking about. Um, what I have seen, you know, particularly though for, for ecosystems like Charlotte, other ecosystems that I spend a lot of time is we're just seeing more competition happening right now uh, in these ecosystems as I think, you know, the traditional venture hubs have started to realize with the distributed nature that COVID has kind of created, hey, I should be hunting anywhere. Uh, physical meetings aren't driving necessarily uh, my, my top of the funnel anymore. And so we're seeing you know, competing term sheets uh, and, and competing and more you know, in pressure, you know, pressure cooker rounds happening in all you know, on tier you know, two, three ecosystems that just haven't had the same volume historically. And I think that's great. That's great to see that starting to happen um, more aggressively, you know, I think some of the, the, the terms and some of the valuations were a little lower in some of these ecosystems relative to the broader market. Um, but look, yeah, I mean, we're seeing multiples, you know, sometimes if, if, if growth is there and it's accelerating, I mean, it, it's, it, it can climb quite high, uh, 50x uh, revenue multiples and north of that. Um, and so, you know, it's definitely, you know, competitive time, you know, to be out there investing um, and trying to find valuations. With respect to, you know, pre-revenue businesses, you know, I, we at Storm don't tend to invest pre-revenue. So it's not a problem we run into quite as much. Um, but you're right. I mean, look, how are investors evaluating? I mean, it's, it's a looking at the team, the understanding of the product, is the product built? You know, where are they in this pre-revenue cycle, right? You could be at an idea and a pitch deck. Um, or you could have a product that's, you know, maybe in early beta. And so depending on where they are, might inform where we would drive valuation. Um, but a lot of times for us, you know, we're looking again at the last round and using that as a fundamental basis to start to think about, you know, where we're thinking about whether the right valuation should be at, at the next round where we're coming in. Um, and so, and I think a, a pretty traditional sort of rule of thumb is an investor will say, hey, look, a 2X markup, you know, is probably at the floor of what someone's looking for in an ideal world. And so let's understand, and then, you know, depending on the unit economics, the business, the market, the competitive elements that we're looking at, we may move up from that multiple to, you know, up to those 50, 60 X multiples, or you may shift downward slightly if there's some hair on the deal for whatever reason. Good. And, and yeah, Frederick, I saw I closed a 150 X um, uh, deal on um, in, in November. So that was, that was wild. That was the, the highest multiple I've seen. And it was seven figure revenue as well, which is, yeah, no, no joke. Um, Don, how about how about you, East Coast perspective on on valuations and what you're seeing? Yeah, the, the valuations are up. Part of that is is kind of a natural progression that when we did Series A ten years ago, there wasn't um, there weren't seed rounds in the same way they are now. I mean, some of the rise in price of the classic A valuation from five to ten to higher is a function of the companies themselves being a little more mature when they arrive on our doorstep. I mean, so that's a natural and maybe very appropriate progression. Right now, I think there are a few distortions in the market, um, uh, really COVID related probably. One is valuations are way up if you grew during COVID. And if you stayed flat during COVID, uh, you're not getting a fair valuation, I think by and large. I mean, I had a company whose revenue was down 91% in, in April and had a flat year. And from my point of view, they had a phenomenal year given that they had faced the crisis, uh, uh, such a dramatic crisis and, and, uh, and, and fought their way through it. So right now, you know, I think we're getting ready for the COVID slingshot, which will be some people who 
uh, whose companies became much better during COVID are gonna do much better when it's over. Um, some companies that grew in COVID may not get the same tailwinds. I think to net it out, valuations are up and they'll stay up. What people pay a premium for or how much of a premium that they'll pay for growth will probably uh, tamper down a little bit. Perfect. So I, it, relatedly to the valuation, you know, you guys are as a, as a venture fund are always sort of thinking about things in terms of ROI, right? And, and you know, what you could eventually, um, you know, turn your, your dollars invested into. So um, related to that, um, and, and Don, how about, how about you start us off and, and Monique, you can finish us on this one. Um, what have you guys seen recently in, in terms of exiting some of your investments, right? Have uh, deal terms changed at all to account for some market uncertainty? Buyer profiles changed, and now we have sort of the rise of the SPACs. What is any any have you guys experienced anything different um, as you're looking at exits? And then actually it related, I'll throw this wrinkle in too from David Jones in the chat. Um, you know, there could be. Do you anticipate a sort of a rush to exits here as we potentially deal with some some changes in the tax code? Who would you like to go first? Don, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So um, we've, um, I think the world has changed where uh, PE firms are uh, readily available, have the available, have the funds, and an interest in in buying companies and progressing them. We have sold seven companies across three funds in the last 120 days, all to PE firms. Um, they paid healthy multiples, God bless them each and every one. Um, and, um, and so the PE outlet is a, a good one. Um, the emergence of SPACs is actually very valuable when a company goes to sell just because a company with some size and maturity can threaten to use the SPAC alternative uh, as a way out to, to pressure buyers. We are not seeing strategics uh, per se uh, it, it, with any of the frequency or, or speed with which the, the PE folks uh, will buy it. And, and given that they're, uh, they're paying good multiples, it's, uh, it's a, a real good out uh, for us. Uh, so things have been real good. I think that they will stay good uh, through most of 21 because there seems to be a lot of interest in, in uh, buying growth and in putting together companies. Perfect. Uh, Monique, how about you? Uh, speak to yeah. exiting transactions recently. Yeah, so we, we aren't thinking about exits very often because it just takes a while for these companies to go from pre-seed to multi-billion dollar business. Um, but we do have some companies that uh, are nearing IPO. And I think generally speaking, the IPO environment has been incredibly strong post COVID. We've seen tons of companies going public and, uh, and doing well and in terms of our most recent public exits, those were announced at the close of 2019, one of which Sam uh, was a co-investor in Honey that sold to PayPal. And we had another company called Email Age that exited to uh, LexisNexis's uh, parent company. And you know those were all, tr all cash transactions. Um, the big question there was, you know, Honey's been doing so well post COVID, what would have happened if they hadn't sold? <laughs> um, they've, they've just been skyrocketing. So I think the question of to exit or not to exit is something that's very real when you're dealing with private companies that are, that are going big. And so uh, timing's definitely a big question. The IPO market's been frankly really healthy overall for venture backed businesses. Um, so we are seeing some of that behind the scenes but aside from that, it's really not top of mind for us because we are so focused on building, you know, long-term businesses. And I think our general stance with companies when we talk to them, if a founder is pitching us and already talking about exiting the business, we like to believe that, and actually one of our, our partners recorded a video on this. He sold his company AdMob to Google. Uh, I forget which year, but he said, as soon as you talk about an exit, then you're 
planning to exit. Like this is, if, if you started the conversation, then it's on your mind, you're already thinking about it. Um, and we would rather focus on building the business and then, you know, have options in the future and keep those options open, but not hyper-focus on, on what our prospects look like yet. Makes total sense. So, all right, let's move to, you know, how we're thinking about investing in, in 2021 and beyond. Um, and Frederick, why don't, you, why don't you take this one first? Um, what trends in, in venture investing are, are, you, are you looking at and, and maybe some hot verticals that, that you see? And, you know, some of this could be, you know, COVID induced and, and some may just be, you know, sort of where the market's headed. But what are you seeing in, in, in the market and where do you think that you, know, you, you will spend some time focusing on? investing. Yeah, you know, it, it's actually, you know, really an exciting time to be a venture investor focused on B2B. I mean, like, I think, you know, COVID fundamentally has created this, you know, I think rapid uh, acceleration of the adoption curve for enterprise software across the, you know, across organizations anywhere, you know, in the United States and globally. And so we've seen that lift across our entire portfolio. And so we're very excited to continue investing. I mean, the reality is, you know, there's still so many different business processes that haven't seen automation yet hit them. You know, there are so many verticals that are huge that are still yet to see true uh, technology, you know, modern technology stacks come in. And so we're actively looking across a lot of different verticals, whether that's government uh, and gov tech and thinking about how government and it can kind of work closer with software vendors to, to innovate, um, looking at digital health quite a bit. Um, COVID, you know, has obviously created a huge, I think, light on the inefficiencies and the issues that we have uh, in the healthcare system and ecos, you know, and, and players. And so we continue to invest there and are very excited about continuing to sort of grow our, our portfolio in that ecosystem. And then, you know, new verticals that maybe we hadn't historically spent quite as much time that we're spending more time evaluating, you know, are kind of voice enabled technologies. So thinking about that next uh, generation of how the voice systems get used in enterprise contexts. Um, you know, obviously in the consumer world, we're beginning to see a lot of interesting voice enabled applications and Alexa, Google Hangouts, all these devices are finding more enterprise and business use cases as my assistant goes running in the background. Um, but we're sitting now in a work environment where these systems are being used in a different way. And so it's been incredible to see that. And then we're spending a lot of time in supply chain. Um, and, the, you know, whether that's supply chain for e-commerce, whether that's supply chain in digital health context. There's just so much opportunity in terms of visualizing, understanding, um, and better just managing the supply chain holistically. And so those are some of the areas we're excited about as we look ahead through the rest of this year uh, and the years to come. That's great. Sam, how about you? Yeah, you know, I think we all try or within Anthos try to force ourselves to be as much of a generalist as possible. You know, we feel like honing on on one or two things will eliminate the possibility of being very opportunistic and finding a, a, a good business that way. Having said that, you know, last year we did a lot in fintech, uh, continue to stay pretty plugged in there. Um, you know, banking as a service, how do these banks really access and, and engage their consumers in a new and different way? Um, how do you start a, um, you know, how do you join a new bank and, and um, KYC AML issues that are happening around that? Um, you know, also, you know, really interested in, in the future of healthcare where, you know, whether that's value-based care oriented or just the access to information that's happening there. You have interoperability that is really coming on strong and, and the ability to, um, you know, use this data um, structured and unstructured in a way that, that you know, you can really be, build a very big business off of. Um, and then also, yeah, I, I think, cybersecurity, anything from that perspective, um, you know, you see once a week, really bad headlines coming out about someone being hacked and customer information being um, accessed. Um, that is a forever changing world. And you're also seeing earlier startups who are wanting to sell into a lot of larger organizations and uh, financial services uh, in particular, where you know, compliance measures need to have taken place a lot earlier for, for companies than historically they, they may have. And so the ability to help kind of speed that up with some compliance automation um, platform. So still trying to stay very much a generalist, but uh, but those are definitely some areas that, that kind of pique my interest. I'd, Nick, I'd add to, I think there's always great opportunity in following the, the natural disruptions in the world, which, you know, right now, in real estate, the way we use real estate, 
the nature of the real estate we own is being disrupted. Logistics is being disrupted by a uh, massive labor shortage amongst truck drivers, as well as the societal interest in, in moving to having everything shipped. The trades, uh, HVAC, plumbing, and other professional trades are being disrupted by a, uh, the fact that uh, young people don't go into the trades and the workforce is being, is aging out. So, you know, it's almost kind of layering, putting disruption on the disruption that exists. So finding opportunities where there's, the, the world is changing, the market is changing, and uh, we want to put companies into, the, into what's next in that market. Uh, and so I think we have massive di disruption today in, in, in very large categories, and uh, they present tremendous opportunities for young companies because there's going to be a new incumbent in town. That makes sense. That makes sense, guys. Thanks for uh, thanks for all the feedback thus far. Uh, final final question for each of the panelists as we're um, winding down here. Uh, what's the single best piece of advice you have for all the entrepreneurs in the audience? And maybe we maybe we start with Monique. That's a that's a tall order. So if I have to pick one. Um, it has something to do with listening to the market and also staying self-aware, I think, as a founder. Um, are you being honest about listening to the market? How well are you listening to the market? What hygiene do you have about listening to the market and gathering data and feedback? And then being able to really prioritize and weed out some of that feedback uh, from a very scrutin like scrutinizing kind of standpoint where you can't make everyone happy, but you do need to really hone in on who is your market. Stay, start really small, start really focused um, and build something real for those users, not the whole world from out the gates. So uh, again, that's a tall order to pick one piece of advice, but. I think just listening to the market, especially now, is particularly uh, pertinent to, to founders. That's excellent advice. Uh, Frederick, how about you? Yeah, it is definitely a tall order. Um, I, I'd say for me, you know, I think that the advice would be do your diligence on the investors you're talking to. Uh, make sure you do the work. Uh, you know, too often, I think folks don't do enough diligence on the investors. Um, and related to that is also don't let the investors drive product roadmap. Um, too often I see that happen. And the reality is investors, you know, no matter what their experience and background is, do not know the product roadmap your customers do uh, and spend time with them. And so, you know, really focus on that. That's good. That's right in line with, with, with Monique, uh, her take and listening to your customers. Um, Don, how about you? I, uh, I would say, uh, Here's the question, what are you trying to prove to the world that you can do? And what are you trying to prove to yourself that you can do? And find VCs that match up with coaching you through what you believe you can do that no one else believes you can do and what you wanna to try to do and succeed at um, that you wanna to prove to yourself that you can. Because a lot of this relationship, if it's functioning well, if wonderfully reciprocal and mutually beneficial. Uh, but having honesty, I think it touches a little bit on Monique's point uh, and Frederick's, both of which I liked. The other thing I'm gonna riff, add to Frederick's, I, my, uh, I, I am always surprised uh, how little diligence is often done by entrepreneurs on us. You know, I want everybody in, that I'm talking to to call everybody I work with. Um, that's my body of work. Um, and if I've worked with somebody for seven years, they can tell you what you need to know. Um, I just strongly advise all the VCs that are in the market uh, have a, a reputation they've earned, good or bad. You should know what it is. That's great. Speaking of reputation, Sam, how about, uh, how about you bring us home here? Um, thanks, Nick. <laughs> um, no, I, I think 
it, it, I mean, it sounds somewhat like a broken record, but it's, you know, finding like the, the, the partnership, you know, there is a transaction that's, you know, you're seeking to have at the end of this process, but, you know, ignoring the price for a second and like where people are going to maybe come out from that and focus on like, what's the value add on, on both sides. And, and Don's completely right. Like it, it's, it sometimes amazes me how late in the process it's like, oh yeah, like, let me do the diligence on Anthos now. Do you have some people I can call them? We're like, you know, negotiating term sheet, if not already signed term, term sheet. And, you know, I think the ability of knowing who, who you're getting in bed with, making sure that, you know, this is someone in a firm that, that you believe aligns in your vision and kind of shares like the same philosophy that you do. Um, and so on, again, that this is, uh, sometimes more expensive than a marriage. So, uh, so, you know, taking it that seriously and evaluating kind of who you are kind of spending time with and taking money from. That's excellent. Well, uh, guys, I, I think that that does it for the questions. Um, thank you again, each of you panelists for, for making time out of your busy schedules to pour into the start of the ecosystem and you know, share some valuable advice. Really, really appreciate it guys. Nick, thank you very much. Uh, great panel, great presentation. Um, I might just comment on the last point that Sam made. Uh, one of our clients said years ago that it's easier to divorce your spouse than it is your venture capitalist. So um, you really do want to make those decisions carefully. I've been doing this now 40 years, and I can tell you that I've been in the court, in the uh, boardroom with um, most of these investors, and they are delight to be in in the boardroom with. So thank you again. It was a great presentation. Uh, finally, you'll see on the screen, again, a highlight with regard to our next meeting. It's going to be May 18th, and it's going to be a morning meeting. 7.30 to 8 will be breakout rooms, and then from 8 to 9 will be the session. And in advance of that, you will be receiving in the next few days an invitation to complete the survey for the TER Executive Compensation Study. Again, we really would look forward to your input there. It'd be very valuable and make the survey even more useful. So thanks so much, Nick. Thank you. Thanks to our panel. Great to be involved with so many entrepreneurs in the Queen City and hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, John.